Um, I just want to start off by telling you a little bit about Stacey Abrams, in case you're the one person in the world who doesn't know. But she is a politician, a lawyer, author, businesswoman. She is my fellow Georgia native and a graduate of Spelman College, a historically black college for women in Atlanta. She was the House Minority Leader for the Georgia General Assembly and 89th House District. She worked as a tax attorney for a law firm in Atlanta and was and was appointed the Deputy City Attorney for Atlanta at age 29. As a businesswoman, she co-founded and served as Senior Vice President of Now Corporation, a financial services firm. She co-founded Nourish Inc., a beverage company with a focus on infants and toddlers. And she is the CEO of SageWorks, a legal consulting firm. I'm exhausted just hearing about all that she's done, and we haven't even gotten to the fact that she is the only Black woman to stand as a gubernatorial candidate for a um, major political party in the U.S. But she has also had an extensive writing career, penning several best-selling novels under the alias of Selena Montgomery, and I hope we get to talk about that. She's the author of Minority Leader, a book of leadership advice, Lead from the Outside, and Our Time is Now power, purpose, and the fight for a fair America. I love that title. And I just want to say it one more time. Our time is now. But we're here today to talk about her latest book, which is a political and legal thriller, While Justice Sleeps. And I read it in one day. I could not put it down. So the way we're going to do things tonight, this event is going to run for one hour. For the first 30 minutes, I'll be in conversation with Stacy, And then in the second half, we're going to be taking your questions. And you can start by asking them now by clicking, clicking on Ask a Question button under the video screen and then just typing in your question. And if you want your name to be mentioned, type it in the box and then press Send. It's as easy as that. So let's get started. Stacy. before we start talking about this amazing book, I would just like to briefly thank you for saving democracy. <laughs> <laughs> I think you give me too much credit, but thank you. You're, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> I must say that living here in Georgia, when the results were announced, everyone was driving, honking their horns. People were playing celebration on their speakers. And we all wore shirts that say, let us turn Georgia Spellman blue. There you go. But let's talk about Wild Justice Sleeps. Now, you start this book with a really awesome forward in which you give the origin story. And I know that you've probably told it quite a few times, but I think there are people who may not have heard it. And it is a great story. Would you start us off by telling us how this book came to be in our hands? Well, Tayari, thank you so much. And thank you to Intelligence Squared for having me. I was a tax attorney and did that for three and a half years at the law firm of Sutherland, Asbill and Brennan. One of the partners there, Teresa Wynn Roseboro, was this extraordinary woman, is an extraordinary woman who was incredibly helpful to me as I realized I did not intend to be a corporate lawyer for the rest of my life. I, <laughs> During my time there, I was also penning my romance novels, and she was always very supportive of my dual personalities, tax attorney, romance novelist. I left to go and serve as deputy city attorney and then left that role to run for office. In 2008, I was having lunch with Teresa. We were chatting about my life and my future and what was happening with her. And near the end of lunch, she said, Stacy, I've been thinking about this idea and I wanted to share it with you. And I said, sure. And she said, do you, do you realize that Article 3 of the Constitution makes no provisions for a federal judge who is incapable of doing their job? And I said, I'm like, wait, what? Because in the U.S. Constitution, the only position that has a lifetime appointment are federal judges. If you're in Congress, you can be removed by being voted out. If you're the president of the United States, we have a whole new constitutional amendment, the 25th Amendment, that allows for the removal. But if you're a Supreme Court justice, for example, and you are enable, you're completely unable to do your job, there is no provision for removing you unless you commit a crime or you die. And I could not let the idea go. So I got home that night finished doing my day job, got in front of my computer and just started thinking, what if the swing justice on the Supreme Court fell into a coma? You know, no one thought of comas back in the 1790s during the creation of the Constitution or 1780s. So what would happen if we had this you know, critical issue and this short period of time and you've got to solve some international intrigue and the person who that you that you have to serve is basically inert to the world. And that was the creation of 
All Just to Sleeps, wrote the first chapter, uh, eventually wrote the book, sent it off to some publishers or to some agents. And that's a whole other story, which we'll get into. <laughs> yes, I am really much into that story. I have a question for you. What do you think is the enduring appeal about novels about lawyers? Law pervades and constructs most of our lives, whether we think about it intentionally or not. Every decision we make, especially in the social contract, is governed by our agreement with one another. And the enforcers or interpreters often of those agreements are lawyers. Plus, lawyers tend to have, if you're lucky, you have an exciting practice where you get to deal with complicated and interesting topics yeah, I, I was a tax lawyer, so my my area of expertise was not the most exciting. And then I was a deputy for the city of Atlanta. But when we read legal stories, legal narratives, they truly investigate the human condition, who we are willing to be when people are watching, what we do when they're not watching. Uh, but lawyers are often our navigators through these complex stories and questions about who we are, who we intend to be, and how good a people we really are. And I felt like as a person who is not a lawyer, as I was reading this novel and reading about Avery, the young law clerk, and how the fate of the world rests in her hands, I felt kind of vicariously powerful. Well, that, and that was the goal. I wanted with with Justice Wynn, who is the main character, uh, whose surname is driven is drawn from Teresa Wynn Roseboro, who was also given a second homage in the book as the chief justice. I really owe her a lot for this book. Uh, Avery was designed to be a character who has authority and responsibility, but no real power. Often we find ourselves called upon to do things, whether it's our boss or our family, where they tell us they want us to do something, but we are not necessarily given the power that goes along with the responsibility. And I really wanted to explore that tension. And what I love about Avery and what I try to do in all of my stories is to say that even if you're not given the power, that doesn't mean you can't find it or create it. And so she has to you know, knit together her own capacity to live out his expectations. And yes, you should end that story feeling very empowered by and energized by how Avery goes from a position of weakness. I mean, she's the least important person in the conversation. She's the law clerk to an inert you know, Supreme Court justice. And yet she has the ability to change the world. Okay, uh, let's. I'm going for people who haven't read it yet because I think it was just released a couple of days ago in the UK. So Avery, she's this young law clerk. Her life, she's got a lot going on in her life. You know, she she has an excellent education. She went to Spelman College and she Indeed. went to and she went to Yale, like some like some other people we know. <laughs> and so she gets the news that the the justice for whom she clerks, the swing vote on the court is in a coma. It's a sketchy situation because this is, in fact, a legal thriller. It's sketchy. And she has to, like, figure out this set of arcane clues to save the world. And so part of the conversation for me with Avery in the very opening scene, we meet Justice Wynn, who is this curmudgeon and who's also not quite, you're not quite certain if he's you know, in full control of his faculties or not. When she steps in, her responsibility is to discern what he intended. And you've got this man who is grappling with his own grasp on reality, trying to give her clues on how to solve this very intricate puzzle without violating her ethics, his ethics, or dying in the process. And so the goal is to make this a very propulsive story where to get to the denouement, to get to the climax, She's got to navigate all of these issues that she's never had to think about. She's got to use her legal skills, but she's also got to use her street smarts and her common sense. And she's got to build a team and she's got to figure out how to do all of this in a really short window of time. Now, you say you wanted to be propulsive. You succeeded. I was just strung along. I had to take notes. I had to underline things, all the different clues to the puzzle. There's like chess involved. And I'm going to ask you again, what is the enduring attraction? I do not play chess, but if I read a book, <laughs> it's got some chess in it. I'm like, hmm. like, what is it about chess that's so appealing? I taught myself to play chess when I was younger. No one I knew played chess, but I, I think I saw either a documentary about it or read a book about it. And so I wanted to learn how to play chess, but no one I knew played. 
so I taught myself to play by reading histories of chess and, you know, uh, manuals on chess. Now, I am not a great chess player. I'm good. I'm functional. I can beat the computer at a really moderate setting, <laughs> but I am not a chess wizard. But what's so interesting about the game itself and the strategy is that chess is about taking a very defined universe and still trying to navigate, gain power, protect someone, and you, your protections often require that you sacrifice others. And the the commentary it has on just society and community and who we are as people and the choices we're willing to make, I think it provides a motif that's always very resonant. Because even if you don't play the game, the notion that you're trying to outwit someone else and that this outwitting takes place on this very stable surface and you've got very clear rules and your job is to make sure the rules apply to them but don't apply to you. Oh, that right there. Like, yeah, that, that, and it's only by your wits that rules can apply to you and not to someone else, not through privilege, just exactly. the, the space you earn for yourself. This plot is complicated, like I said, and I want to know, are you an outliner writer or are you a make it up as you go along kind of writer? No, no. So I start out with a construct. I knew I wanted the story to be about this young woman who has to solve this problem and her only guide is basically you know, dead to the world. I also knew that I needed to make the story complicated enough that it would warrant the speed, the intensity and the heightened set of issues. And so that takes time. So I had to lay out what would need to be in the book. So I do a synopsis first, then I do an outline and then from the outline, I actually do a storyboard where I have to connect every dot. Now, once I do that, I then go deep into research to make sure I know enough about the topic that if you're an expert, you know, I respect you, even if you know, like that doesn't quite happen that way. And if you're a layperson, I sound really smart. <laughs> and once I do all of that, I start writing, but things happen that I don't expect. And what's so fun for me about writing is that even though I have a very clear start point and I know from chapter to chapter what I need to do, I'm always surprised by what my characters do, what they say, how they may change in the midst of a moment. I had a character who was supposed to die who stays alive in the book and I had a character who was supposed to live who had to die uh, because their story just changed from what I thought it would be. And so I'm, I'm sort of betwixt in between those two poles. I know what I intend to do, but my characters always decide they're going to do something completely different. And my job is to go along as I can. That's so interesting to me. And I can, I can see that in certain kinds of novels, but it seems like in a, in a thriller, the people need to do what you tell them to do. You would think so, but they're very independent characters. They're, they're creatures of imagination and they take full reign. Uh, I, and I'm a, a, my, one of my best friends, she laughs when I talk about them as though they are, you know, disembodied, you know, exist, they have a disembodied existence separate from my mind. But I think the most fun writing happens when you're discovering the story too, I know the universe and let's go back to chess. I know the universe. I know the playing field, but what's always intriguing to me is once you're building a character out, once the character has form and function and personality, what you thought would make sense doesn't make sense because that's not what that character would do. Now that you bet, now that you know the person better, Avery, there are parts of Avery when I got to know who she really was, I'm like, oh, she's not going to do this thing I wanted her to do. Or when there was a secondary character who should have stayed in the background and actually became more of a forefront character, it's because that person turned out to be more intriguing or interesting than I thought they'd be. I'm so curious. Who, who, who was so I'm intriguing? I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> I think it's her roommate, but I could be wrong. <laughs> Now, another question that I had, and I mean, this book, it's a lot of fun. Like it's twisty, it's turny. You you feel like you're in safe hands. The stakes are high, but you're still having a great time. But this, there were some other things about this book that aside, it's kind of a Trojan horse story in a way that the fun brings you in the door. But it made me think about a lot of things. Like one of the things I really thought about was Avery and her mother, you know, Avery has this very high powered job, but she, her mother is an addict mm -hmm. and that's kind of a secret that she has from everyone at work. And of course, you know, with the question of a novel, you always have to punch it up to get the stakes, to get the stakes high enough to make it story worthy. But I also thought about it a lot about people who've had 
um, who've kind of moved up in life, who've, who've, who've leapfrogged a couple of class mm-hmm. status, and that this other life you have is something that you look like, you look like, your life looks like your colleagues. They went to Yale, you went to Yale. You know, they went here, you went there. They studied abroad, you studied abroad, all of that. But Avery has a a different past, and it impacts, I think, the way that she makes decisions in the space in which she finds herself. It's a truism that wherever you go, you bring yourself with you. And what I wanted from this, exactly. (laughs) And what I wanted from this story is that Avery is not to the manor born. She was not expected to be in the space. And as we learn more about her life, we learn more about just how unlikely her position of power is. And it's one of the reasons that Justice Wynne turns to her. And it's how she can pull together the wherewithal to, to you know, discern what needs to be done. But it also pulls at her. She loves her mother. And her mother is a troubled woman who has an addiction. One of the pieces for me is to to humanize, and not, and, and not humanize is the inaccurate term, but so often in thrillers or in suspense world, when we hear about addiction, it's this very one-dimensional characteristic. It makes you either hero or villain. It's supposed to be, it's often used as sort of an attribute to, if you're thinking of Sherlock Holmes, to heighten the mind. But fundamentally, it's about who are you when you are in the grip of addiction and who were you before that addiction manifested. And so often we don't get to see the complexity of relationship that allows us to remember that these are full and multidimensional people who have this disease, but who also have these obligations and they are other people. Most people I know, not most people, but many people that I know have family members with addiction. I I do. And I've always been troubled by the very flat affect that is attributed to those who, who are challenged with addiction. These are people who can be gracious and tremendous and kind and also do vile, reprehensible things when they're in the grip of their addiction or to feed their addiction. And the complexity of who that person is deserves to have a life, especially as it intersects with the story. I was really, I was very moved by, by that relationship. And I was also, I was also struck by the idea of, like, I know I read in your forward to the book that you had a hard time publishing the book because the, what did you say? The publishers did not believe that the president could be that corrupt. Yes. Uh, So it was the first time I, trotted it out. I wrote it on spec. So for anyone who writes for a living, you love being on contract. That means somebody already wants the thing you're going to write and you're writing it to fulfill your contract and to fulfill your, of course, your artistic aspirations. When you write on spec, it's when you are writing, hoping somebody else cares about this book. I had written almost every book on contract. My very first book I wrote on spec, but it got per- it got picked up, you know, within a few months of me, you know, sending it out into the world. And so I'd had a storied opportunity in my, you know, fiction writing. When I got to While Justice Sleeps, I was in the middle of a contract with Harper Collins to produce romantic suspense novels, but this idea just wouldn't let me go. And so in the midst of that contract, I wrote this book. And so I'm a state legislator. I'm working on this. There's this guy running for office in uh, the United States uh, for president. I did a little, a few things uh, very, and I don't want to overstate it. I you know, supported his campaign, but you had the sort of heightened w- world of campaigning happening. I was starting a small business. I had these two book contracts and then I wanted to write this other book. So my time management skills are good, but my decision-making skills were terrible that year. So I start writing this book. I finish it by 20, 2009, 2010. I send it to my former, now former romantic expense agent And he he was kind about it. He and his assistant tried to help me with it. But there was concern that the president was too corrupt. And this idea of international intrigue and a president betraying America in that way just made no sense. So I put it aside, came back in 2015, tried it again. This time my agent had retired from the business. And so I sent it out to other agents and no one would pick it up. And the rejection letters I got 
to a person said, well, the president seems absurd. No one would be that way. And no one really cares about the Supreme Court. Fast forward to 2019, world slightly different. And this time <laughs> slightly. people bought it. <laughs> you know, I think about things like that because because I, I had because that was in the forward to the book, it was in my playing in the background of me reading it. And I think there's something to be said for the right book at the right time. Mm-hmm. Like, would you anticipate that? I mean, you've had tremendous reception to this book. It's a number one New York Times bestseller. Um, do you think that had you published it when you did, it would have that same response? Oh, of course not. I, I think I am intentional enough with my writing that I think it's a good story and it would have been a good story at any moment. But the contextualization in the wake of Donald Trump, in the wake of the just hyper politicization of the Supreme Court, the fact that some people know my name now, I think all of those things come together to, I think, highlight the, the why someone should read the book. But as a writer, my responsibility is to make certain that no matter why you pick it up, that you don't put it down. And so while I do think this is the time for the book, I try my best to always write a book that won't rely on externalities, that I do a good job respecting the story, respecting the words, and respecting the characters. Yes, I complete. I mean, I do think it's an excellent story for any time. But right now, this moment, I feel like the work, the work it does, because we, we all are kind of open to the idea that it is possible that the United States president could be really corrupt. Like, I could buy that. And that this, the, the way that I got caught into it, I felt like even though the book isn't what I would describe as, it's not didactic. Like, it, I don't feel like the book is pointing me to any political philosophy, mm-hmm. but it did make me feel more vigilant in terms of keeping my eyes open. And I think that had this come out during the Obama years, I think, I I just think it's a different thing. I think people would be like, I'm not trying to hear about no corrupt presidents. You know, send me another picture of Boulder Water Dog, you know? (laughs) Yeah, and I I think you're right. I mean, part of of publishing is reading the moment. And so I am not offended by or disparaging of those who did not see the book's potential when it was offered. And thank God no one anticipated we would find ourselves in a moment where this kind of story would have resonance. Uh, But, you know, and much of my work outside of my writing is focused on making sure we never have to have that conversation again. But, you know, we're American, so it'll happen. That said, I, I appreciate the fact that I'm in a moment where people not only can read the book, they can feel that heightened sense of urgency without feeling overwhelmed by it. So that while... For me, it was a bit prescient to write it. Right now, it's more retrospective than it is current events. And I think that is a good thing, that we are not trying to use this as a roadmap for how do we get rid of a corrupt president. Yes. And it it is so optimistic, this work. I mean, it is about the slimiest, most corrupt president ever and some really ruthless government officials. They are like killing people in their houses. They have like special chemicals. They'll just like evaporate you. It's terrible. But... But it's incredibly optimistic. It's it's almost as though the fact that you are writing a novel about a Supreme Court clerk, it it means that you do have faith in the system. I have faith in people. And I recognize that the system is a construct of who we are. We we who live in democracies should be reminded constantly that democracy is an ideal. There, there is no actual democracy unless we sustain it. That government is a construct of our imaginations, our collective imaginations, that if we put some people in charge and we do what they say, then things will work. And so far, so good. But the, con- the, the, the contrary is that if we decide that we don't believe in this endeavor, that we don't believe in this greater capacity of us to pool our resources and pool our intentions so that we can live in some semblance of harmony, it all falls apart. I believe that people are better than we sometimes let ourselves think. And I am vigilant about creating constantly the reinforcement of why this approach makes sense. There are those who will decry, you know, know, the systems of democracy versus autocratic systems I like being able to make a decision. I like being able to publish a book. 
but even more, I like having the, the authority to be angry and to be critical of my leadership. I believe that I should have that opportunity. And what is so, for me, a grounding moment in writing While Justice Sleeps is that I get to be critical of all of these things, even though I'm a part of it. I was a state legislator when I was writing these books. And I get to critique myself. I get to critique my, the systems I've become a part of. And I get to hold myself and others accountable for being better each time, each day than we were the day before. Well, I, and you also seem to have a great fun doing it. Yes. Um, some of the descriptions, some of the descriptions of the politicians really cracked me up. I was like, oh, I was like, oh, that's a little pointed, but I'm here for it. I like it <laughs> I, because it's part of the, the, the momentum of this particular, this particular type of story. Now, how did you come to writing fiction in the first place? I've written for as long as I can remember. I learned to read when I was very young. My parents were avid storytellers in their different ways. My mom was a librarian. We were too poor to have babysitters and daycare after preschool. And so we would just leave. We were on my, the college campus where my mom worked. So we'd leave the daycare or we'd leave preschool and we'd sleep in the stack. So I used to literally sleep surrounded by books. And I love them. I, and my mom and dad were very encouraging of reading. And so I was able to read any, if I could reach it, I could read it, which meant that I had this very broad sense of what could be. And on top of that, my dad was this amazing storyteller who tells these very fantastical stories, like a clean version of Game of Thrones, but it would have like layers and, you know, you'd have generational issues. Uh, there are six of us. So my dad would have to satisfy every child mm -hmm. and they're part of the story. But that for me was just an invitation to imagination. Once I started writing, I've written just about anything you can imagine. I for a moment thought of myself as a country music writer, uh, but I've written fiction. I've written nonfiction. The first time I published my first romantic suspense novel, I was also publishing a novel on the operational or not novel, a treatise on the operational dissonance of the unrelated business income tax exemption. Two very separate conversations. But for me, there is there is a joy in being able to construct a world to get to visit it. And if you do it right, to enjoy that visit every time. An invitation to imagination. That is just I think that is something every parent should try to offer their children. Just the just the permission to dream. Mm -hmm. And that dream can take many forms like your heroine. Your heroine has had lots of jobs and done lots of different things. And so I, that eclecticness, I think, show the eclectic expertise you have. It's so clear. It's a novel. Like, you know, a <laughs> lot about all kinds of things. But it's in a way that for me as a reader was was very accessible. I was I was I, I was very, very much into it. And I want to know, I think I just got a message that it's about time for us to start taking audience questions. You see, we have the the question at the bottom of your screen where you can ask questions. Here's someone's, here's a pretty, a question that I think we all want to know, which is how in the world do you find the time and media focus to write novels and also working full time to change the world? Oh, I, I appreciate that. I, my life is a, an ongoing game of Jenga. So I think about it, you, you construct your tower and you put in all the pieces that you want. And for me, there's never been a divide between the responsibility to serve and the responsibility to dream. And so my responsibility then is to find, to pull out the pieces as I need to, to give priority to what's the most urgent right now. Uh, you know, democracy's in a little bit of trouble here in the United States, trying to make sure we can preserve the right to vote for everyone. But I also have other interests and obligations and my construction is that I'm going to pull out the pieces. I'm going to organize my day to do the pieces that make the most sense, whether it's writing or watching TV or you know, testifying before the Senate. But I also expect that at some point I'm going to pull out the wrong piece and the whole thing is going to collapse. And I think what tends to throw people off and stop them from constructing their tower is the fear that if it collapses, they're done. My belief is if it collapses, it just means I have to rebuild it. And the next time I build it, I will know which piece was wobbly and which piece to put on the top versus which one's used as a foundation. 
but I'm not afraid of the collapse. And I think that mindset more than anything else is why I can try to do all of these different things. And I'm also perfectly okay with not being successful. I mean, this book sat on the shelf. In fact, I forgot about it until 2019 because nobody wanted it. And luckily for me, a friend reminded me I had it. And now I was able to share it with others. And lucky for us, you continued writing it and revising it. I think that's really important too. Like the story wouldn't leave you alone, regardless of what the publishers did. Yeah. I mean, I will, I will say I, when I sent it out in 2015 and no one bit, I put it aside because by then I'd become democratic leader. I was doing voter registration work and I'd forgotten about the book, but after I didn't become governor in 2018, I had some time on my hands and I was invited to go out to California and talk about my romance novels Um, And all my romance novels are romantic suspense, so they all have this sort of through line. And I was in a meeting with the producer who asked me if I had any other books in the works. And I said, well, you know, I'm in the middle of this children's novel and I've got, you know, two thirds of the way through this superhero novel about a teenager. And oh, yeah, I wrote this legal thriller years ago and it does this. And she said, you know, wait, is it written or are you working on it? I said, oh, no, it's done. And I'm sitting there with my agent. And they look at me and they're like, wait, you've got a whole novel just sitting there? And I'm like, I probably should have mentioned that. So when I get back, I have to call my literary agent and say, by the way, I have this whole book that I completely forgot to mention to you because she's the one who helped me sell my nonfiction work. And I I say all that to say this. We all have things we have tried and we put it aside either by necessity or simply because we gave up hope. And I'm so grateful for the fact that even though I didn't know anyone would ever read it, I never let it disappear completely from you know, my imagination. Our next question gets um, a little bit into the weeds about the Constitution. Yep. It says, Stacy's book hinges on the imperfection in the Third Amendment of the Constitution. In her new book, Carol Anderson, my colleague at Emory, argues that the Second Amendment's intention was to arm white people so they could retain full control of Black Americans. What can be done about these imperfections in the document that so many Americans consider to be sacrosanct and perfect? So I want to separate the two pieces out. So my book is premised on Article 3 of the Constitution. So if you... Yes. If you've read the Constitution, Article 1 sets up Congress, Article 2 sets up the presidency, Article 3 sets up the judiciary. And... Over time, we have amended the Constitution to address the infirmities. We haven't had to do a lot with Article 1, with the exception of allowing individuals to elect the U.S. Senate. Article 2, we created the uh, 25th Amendment that says that when a president is incapable of doing the job, you can go ahead and do something about it without waiting for the four years to lapse and possible Armageddon. But we have left alone Article 3. The... So that's one set of challenges. And I do think it calls for, if not investigation, then at least attention, Uh, because judges are the only people contemplated by the Constitution who have permanent employment. And they weren't really thinking about persistent vegetative states when that happened. Then you have the constitutional amendments, and we have to remember, as I said earlier, we no matter where you go, you bring yourself with you. No matter who we become as a society, we bring the vestiges and the origin stories of our constitution with us. It is an extraordinary document that organizes us as a society, but it is a troubled document that has always had tension between its stated goals and its actual lived experience. In the original constitution, I'm not considered human. And that's that's problematic and we've remedied it. And in the same way, I believe over time, we need to continue to remedy the constitutional infirmities. The challenge is that in today's society, the only way to remedy the constitution is either to have Congress through super majorities decide to fix things and they can't agree that you know it's the, the sun rises and sets or you can have a constitutional convention, but if you do a convention, everything is on the table. And I'm not exactly certain what would be done if everybody got to come together and decide what they wanted this time. So for now, my approach is to focus on those who interpret the constitution, meaning having judges who actually care about our communities, those who pass the laws that live out the daily experience of our constitution. And that's why I work so hard 
to elect people that I think are the right ones. And then making sure that we have a consistent capacity to engage. And that's why I fight for voting rights. This is a very, I think, unsatisfying answer, but it is the, the only practical answer given where we are. Because in the absence of the Constitution in the United States, given the sheer size and demography, without this organizing theory of the case, I can only worry about what would follow. You know, this conversation just made me think of something about the in, another thing that in, the enduring popularity of conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the the political thriller, the legal thriller, necessarily assumes a kind of thrill of a conspiracy? Like, oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I love thinking about him uh, <laughs> because part of it is. We we see as individuals, we cede so much power to others and we don't think about it. Just the baseline, traffic lights. Traffic lights should make no sense. We presume that what we are seeing on our side of the light, other people can see on their side of the light. And when that fails, we get collisions. But we don't see people just sort of slowly you know, inching their way through. My approach is that we've got to recognize always that the challenges of society are going to spawn conspiracies. We're always going to be worried about what is because we don't know enough about who's doing what. Because I like when I was reading the book, I was enjoying being like, oh, wait, that's a chess move. And that means that and the mysterious rivers over yes. here. And what about the guy in India with exactly. the chess tube? But when I, but you know, but when I closed the book, I closed the book. Or like when I was a teenager, I was told that if you play a Prince record back when we had records, if you play it this way instead of that way, it'll reveal some message about you know, the nature of the universe and Satan. And I mean, that was, <laughs> that was fun when I was a teenager, but I'm just really struck by the moment we're in when so many people are using these kind of conspiracy theories as to how they govern their actual lives. Well, I, so as with anything taken to extremes, things go horribly wrong. I write conspiracy theories because I find them interesting and fascinating. And I've, done enough of the pieces I talk about that eh, if you spin it out, this could happen. The problem is when you no longer have the discernment to determine what is possible and what is likely. A lot of things are possible. Everything that I write about in my book is possible. Is it likely? Of course not. But it's when we lo lose that ability to, to challenge a sense of what could spin out and we just decide to camp out in the, the crazy. <laughs> That's very succinct. Yes. A lot of people are more than camping out, man. They're buying property in the crazy. Exactly. Now, someone wants to know, who are your favorite legal novelists? So you're all trying to get me in trouble. Uh, I, <laughs> well, I, I will. Okay. Tell me, tell me. I was going to no, say, no. I, could, I could look at the back of the book and say who's, who are the exactly. favorites. I, I can read you a list. Yes. It's very impressive. Thank you. You should no, take look, a bow. I, no, I, I'm deeply appreciative. And, and the reality is, yes, the wonderful part of this area of fiction is that it spawned so many incredible writers who have very different approaches to the storytelling, to the investigation, and to how they use the law as their jumping off point. And so I really do love them all. And it's not just because I don't want anyone to be mad at me and kill me in a book. <laughs> yeah, people will do that. Mm -hmm. Well, and also I noticed that you all, people also will wink at their friends in books. Can you talk a little bit about how you found the names for your characters? So I love naming characters after people I know. I But my rule is I will name a character after you if you let me, but you might die. And so as long as you're good with dying, we're good. Uh, and so usually I will pay homage to people who helped me, people who were nice to me on days when I needed it. Uh, I don't put anyone in that I really actually despise because one, that's just mean and it's it's petty, but I will do some petty things with the name. So my very first book, my, my um, romantic suspense novel was based on my ex-boyfriend's dissertation. And in the book, uh, we are friends now, we're dear friends, but, and he, we were friends when I wrote the book, but I was still a little bitter about our breakup. So in the book, he, he languishes in prison and will be there for the, all of the eternity of that book. 
So, you know, I could be a little petty, but I told him about it. And I also thanked him for giving me the idea for the book. Well, there you go. I think, you know, they say if people, if you don't want people to write about you in a negative way, you should be nicer to them. Exactly. And and don't leave a voicemail. Yes. Do not, do not, (laughs) do not leave any of, if you learn anything from reading this book, be very careful about what you leave in voicemail. Exactly. (laughs) Now, um, Jacqui Francis from the, from Birmingham in the UK wants to know what roles black colleges play in the U S um, this person is British, but lived in the U.S. for a while and went to Dillard. So as Tyre and I both are, we are uh, graduates of Spelman College. And Spelman makes a very necessary uh, cameo in Avery's story. There are three things I think black colleges do. One is that it is a place where you can explore all of the facets of who you are, not despite your identity, but without identity being used to constrain your concept of possibility. Number two, you can learn about a wider array of conversations because you're encouraged to understand the complexity of diversity, the complexity of race, class, gender in a space that has always had to contend with what race means. And three, you find some of the most vibrant minds in the academy coming back and pouring back in to those that, you know, train them. And I think that's one of the most refreshing parts about being in an HBCU, historically black college or university, that you have this incredible opportunity to learn from sage and erudite people who respect knowledge, but also expect you to do exactly what they were able to do. When you were at Spelman, did you take a class from Pearl Clegg? I did. I took a playwriting class. I took a class from her too. And I always say the first time I met a writer, she was my teacher and she was a black woman. And I don't know very many people who can say that. She, she was, so there are two people who I credit with how I think about writing who were actual people I've met, Pearl Klieg and uh, Ann Allstott. Now, Ann Allstott was a, she was my tax professor at law school. And she helped me with this construct of, you know, and she did it for nonfiction because I was a research assistant, but it applies to fiction. Every story should create a problem, complicate the problem, and then solve the problem. So, you know, what's the problem? Why is it a problem? And how do you solve it? And every good book does all three. And the books that you get really irritated with that you throw across the room or you walk away from, they fail usually to do that middle piece. They give you a problem and eventually they solve it, but they never really give you an excuse or an explanation for why it's a problem. With Pearl Klieg, what she did was really teach me the interior of a story. And that was someone has to live and someone has to die. And that someone can be a person, it can be an idea, it can be a belief system, but that you cannot create a sustainable tension in a story if there are no stakes. And you say that and you think, of course, but we've all read stories where the stakes aren't high, they don't really... I mean, look, a phone call would solve the problem or reading the other side of the envelope, you know, when you get really frustrated with thrillers and what she taught me and and probably you is that when you invest in your characters, when you ask your reader to invest, that there has to be payoff and that payoff has to be either, you know, actual in terms of life or death or constructive in terms of something failing and something succeeding. But if everyone comes out the same or if there is no change or worse, when there's things are just so you know pale that it doesn't really matter, then why did you invest the time to write it, let alone read it? It's so funny when you say a phone call with fix it or something. Do you, when you're writing, do you think about the way that technology is making it hard to get a plot off the ground? Because like when you think <laughs> about it, if, if, like if Juliet could have just texted Romeo and said, not really dead, LOL, we'll explain later, the whole story wouldn't happen. Like so many plots depend on people not being able to get in touch with each other. Well, but, but so you could solve that problem because he could be, you know, he could live in South Georgia where you don't have the internet and where (laughs) your cell coverage is, is very weak, or you can be, you know, a Gen Z or who, or Gen Y or who doesn't believe in actually tech, you don't check your messages because you use a phone to text and not to answer. And what if they were in a place where she couldn't 
say it out loud because, you know, the Montagues and Capulets were in the middle of this massive fight. And so saying it out or she couldn't get cell coverage. Basically, there are all kinds of reasons that it could happen. But yes, communication is the easiest tool to use because it's also the most real. The inability of humans to share information despite every technology and every opportunity remains a real and devastating truth. A young person asked me the other day, like a kid, like an 11 year old said, how come when someone doesn't answer the phone, you say they're not home? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, because he, he doesn't understand the phone nope. is being bound to any particular place. Yep. We, we are really running low on time. So I'm going to have to pick a question that I'm going to say, which one, which one do I want to answer? Here's something that would probably be a good note to end on, which is they asked, what is your advice to young people who are starting out in politics or in writing? Or is your advice to both the same? It's three things. One do it. Uh, You are starting out and regardless of who has succeeded or failed before you, you are wholly unique and different and you can bring their stories with you, their opportunities with you, but you are going to craft your own narrative, your own path. Two, you are going to mess up. It is inevitable and it is not permanent. And three, your responsibility is to to serve, whether that service is in politics by helping make lives better, or that service is in storytelling. So someone can see a narrative and enter a world they may not otherwise have found, but that service is an obligation. It's not a choice. And when we treat it as a choice, we sometimes deny ourselves uh, the joy of doing it. And when you treat it as an obligation, you're going to do it. It may not be everything you wanted, and it may never become what you wanted it to be, but you will never regret the fact that you actually gave it a chance. Now, what advice do you have for people? Is that the same advice you have for people who are not young people who have aspirations? My parents went to graduate school at the age of 40. They had six children in tow, moved us from Mississippi to Georgia to go to Emory University where Tyree Jones teaches. And they did it because they believe that there is never a moment where you cannot learn, you cannot change, you cannot grow. They're awesome people. I like them a lot. Well, they raise a hell of a daughter. I'll say that. Thank you. (laughs) And well, that is that is um, pretty much the end of our time. The book is Where Justice Sleeps. I highly recommend it. I think if you read it, do not read it on the subway because you will miss your stop. You'll look up and you'll be so far from home. You won't know where you are because you completely get sucked in. So it has everything you're going to want in the story. It's fast paced, but also it is substantive and it, it gives you a lot to think about and a lot to feel. So thank you for writing it and thank you for sharing with us.